Disappearing in wilderness areas can particularly be a challenging thing for search and rescue teams due to the rugged terrain and limited communication options. Despite the thorough search conducted by volunteers and professionals, no trace of these people are ever really found, and very rarely are any of their belongings discovered. In cases like this where a person goes missing in a remote area without apparent whereabouts, it becomes difficult to determine what might have actually happened. There are various possibilities including accidents, getting lost, encountering wildlife, and experiencing a medical emergency. This is what we call the missing 411 phenomena. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly what's happening to these people. It's important to note that wilderness environments can be unpredictable and even experienced backpackers can face unexpected challenges or accidents. Sometimes individuals who go missing in such areas are never found, leaving their disappearance a mystery. Now, this is where you'll see things like Bigfoot and aliens pop up, but to be respectful, we'll probably leave those out of today's episode. Before I jump into today's cases, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you guys to be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. We are very close to 300,000 subscribers and it would be great to hit that sometime in the summer. And now, without further ado, let's jump right into these creepy and downright strange missing 411 horror stories that'll have you scratching your head tonight and have you looking over your shoulder next time you're in the woods. Bobby Bizzup, missing from Cabin Camp, St. Malo. The disappearance of Bobby Bizzup is a tragic and mysterious case. In 1958, 10-year-old Bobby Bizzup went fishing in Cabin Creek at Camp St. Malo, a Catholic's boys' camp. A counselor named Terry Cohen informed Bobby that it was time for dinner, and Bobby nodded to indicate that he understood. However, within an hour, the camp realized that Bobby was missing. Despite extensive search efforts by numerous counselors, Bobby could not be found. The camp's director, Reverend Richard Heister, notified Bobby's parents and a U.S. forest ranger station about the disappearance. Unfortunately, Bobby remained missing for over a year. In July 1959, Bozzy Bizzup's remains were discovered just below the timberline. Identification was made through scraps of clothing, bones, and fragments of a child's hearing aid, indicating that it was indeed Bobby's body because he did indeed use hearing aids. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance and subsequent death remained unclear at the time. In 2021, a skull believed to belong to Bobby Bizzup was turned over to federal authorities by a man named Dr. Tom McCloskey. Dr. McCloskey revealed that he had been in possession of the item via his father, Dr. Joseph McCloskey, who was a prominent member of the Catholic Church and a close friend of the priest running Camp St. Mallow when Bobby vanished. Dr. Tom McCloskey inherited the skull in 1980 after his father's death and upon seeing a documentary called Mystery on Mount Meeker, he decided to contact federal authorities. The documentary, Mystery on Mount Meeker, produced by WBIR's Nine Wants to Know, shed light on the case and raised questions about the sequence of events when Bobby disappeared. It revealed that three camp counselors went on to abuse children as priests, suggesting a disturbing connection. DNA testing on the skull is underway to determine if it does belong to Bobby Bizza. The investigation aims to uncover the truth about what happened to Bobby and potentially shed light on the circumstances surrounding his disappearance and death. It is a tragic and complex case to say the least, and without further information or the DNA testing results, it is truly difficult to answer what exactly happened to Bobby Bizza. The investigation and analysis of evidence will hopefully bring closure and answers to this long-standing mystery, and I will be sure to make an update video as soon as I see more information. Robert Bissell, Roaring River Wilderness Area on a fateful day in July 2010, 57-year-old Robert Bissell embarked on a solo camping trip to the remote Roaring River Wilderness area. 
known as a seasoned backpacker and outdoor enthusiast, Bissell sought the tranquility and solitude of nature while indulging in his passion for fishing. Leaving his home in Portland, Oregon, he filed a wilderness use permit with the U.S. Forest Service, stating his expected return date of July 16th. Little did anyone know that this would be the last time Robert Bissell would ever be seen. Driving his white 1989 Nissan Sentra with Oregon license plates, Bissell parked at Trailhead 700 near Rock Lakes. From there, he hiked approximately five miles to establish his campsite off Trail 512 near Middle Rock Lake. Strangely, it appeared that he only intended to be away for a day or two as he left behind his sleeping bag and gear, taking only his fishing rod and tackle. Concern arose when Bissell's brother visited the campsite on July 19th and July 24th, finding no trace of him. The Clackamas County Sheriff search and rescue team was alerted and on the morning of July 25, 2010, an extensive search operation was launched. The search efforts encompassed the Roaring River Wilderness, Rock Lakes Basin, and the surrounding trail system and lakes including Serene Lake, Shining Lake, and Shell Rock Lake. Reports from fellow campers indicated that they had encountered Robert at the beginning of his trip, approximately 20 miles southeast of Estacada. Bissell had left a note detailing his itinerary, providing a glimpse into his plans and thought process. Searchers hypothesized that he had set up camp and then embarked on a day hike to fish in the Rock Lakes Basin area given that his fishing gear was missing. The area was known for its abundant trout population, making it an ideal fishing spot. To aid in the search, flyers were distributed in campgrounds, trailheads, ranger stations, and the nearby town of Estacada, appealing for any information that could assist in locating Robert Bissell. Sergeant James Rhodes of the Clackamas County Search and Rescue Unit considered the possibility that Bissell may have sustained an injury during his trek in the challenging terrain of the Mount Hood National Forest. However, the relatively cool temperatures at the time were not expected to pose an immediate threat of hypothermia. Despite the deployment of hundreds of volunteers and 60 to 70 professional searchers, as well as the utilization of helicopters, search dogs, mounted horse patrols, and other resources, no sign of Robert Bissell was ever discovered. The search teams worked diligently, adhering to standard search and rescue procedures. They ventured into new areas, calling out and blowing whistles, hoping for a response that never came. Throughout the operation, various items thought to belong to Bissell were found, but none were able to be confirmed upon examination. In addition, other campers were interviewed, who had apparently interacted with Robert during his camp setup. Curiously, Bissell's clothing and fishing gear were never located. It was as if he had just vanished without a trace, leaving unanswered questions and a sense of mystery. The extensive search efforts were officially concluded on August 3, 2010, without indicating Robert Bissell's whereabouts. The rough and unforgiving terrain of the Mount Hood National Forest presented numerous challenges, even causing search horses to lose their shoes. Ronald Scott Gray, Selway Wilderness Region. Massachusetts hunter Ronald S. Gray vanished without a trace over seven years ago during a fall hunting expedition in the rugged Selway area of Idaho, near Kuskia. Despite an extensive month-long search by ground and air teams, the 62-year-old hunter from Essex County was never located. There seems to be a semblance of closure as Nancy Gray, his widow, recently petitioned the court to declare her missing husband legally deceased. A specific date for the hearing on the petition is yet to be determined. Ronald Gray, a retired Massachusetts State Police Major, was an enthusiastic outdoorsman and a former U.S. Marine combat veteran who had served in Vietnam. According to court records, his last communication was via radio on September 19, 2008, stating that he was at High Line Lakes and planned to return to his companion's Outfitters Camp at Outer Butte by September 23rd. It was common for Gray to embark on solo hunting trips for multiple days, occasionally surpassing his intended return date. When he failed to return by September 26th, his disappearance was reported to the Idaho County Sheriff's Office. 
The search efforts involved a collaboration between personnel from Idaho and Clearwater counties, Hillcrest Aviation, and the Idaho Army National Guard. Despite their combined efforts, no trace of Gray was ever discovered. However, a fanny pack containing some of his personal belongings was found at High Line Lake. The search spanned a vast and challenging terrain covering approximately 1,000 square miles, ranging in elevation from 2,000 to 7,000 feet. Unfortunately, the search had to be suspended on October 14th due to worsening weather conditions. The total cost of the search operation remains undisclosed, but the helicopter services alone amounted to around $20,000 with contributions of $1,975 made by the Gray family and friends. In an affidavit submitted to the district court in Grangeville, Nancy Gray expressed her profound shock at her husband's unexpected disappearance, stating, Ron has always been very upbeat and looking forward to the next adventure. She could never have foreseen that his hunting trip in Idaho in 2008 would mark his final endeavor. Nancy's petition to declare her husband legally deceased is handled by attorney Victoria Olds, based in Grangeville. You can find more information about this online or at The Charlie Project. Minami Shinomura Case takes us to Hirogano Kogen Campground in Gujo, Japan. With just under 40 acres, it's the largest campsite in Gujo, and it has beautiful bungalows, cottages, and even a mountain villa. A post made to the Unsolved Mysteries subreddit details the tragic case of Manami Shinomura, a 10-year-old girl who disappeared while on a school outing with multiple chaperones and 84 of her 5th grade classmates. She had expressed her excitement for the trip to her big sister, Akumi, just the night before. Manami was the youngest of her three sisters who were raised by their single mother, Masuyo, and I was unable to find many details about her father. By all accounts, Manami was a sweet girl with a bright, cheerful personality who loved to sing and dance despite having endured many struggles in her short life. She was born with a heart condition that required surgery, and she had Down syndrome. Her poor health left her much smaller than the other children, and she required adult assistance with everyday tasks. That isn't to say she was lonely. Manami enjoyed going to school, and she had plenty of friends in her class. Her mother also stated she was very aware of her special needs and knew better than to wander off on her own, yet she never returned from her field trip. On July 23, 2009, the large group from Tokuname Nishi Elementary School arrived at the campground, where they planned to stay for three days. While there, the campsite was closed to the public, giving the children free reign to experience nature to its fullest during their outdoor classes. The first night went off without a hitch, but day two is when things took a tragic turn. Sometime between 7.30 and 8 on the morning of July 24th, the school principal witnessed Manami and four friends passing by on their way to preview some test or demonstration scheduled for later that evening. Different sources translate exactly what this activity was, but the principal noted that Manami was lagging behind the group. And though he found the site concerning, he chose not to follow. It was only a short time later when her friends returned without her claiming she had vanished. The path they were on formed a loop. All you had to do was just simply follow it, and you would return to the starting point. But if she went off trail, danger lurked in practically every direction. There was a paved road nearby, the eastern slope had cliffs that even adults couldn't climb, and there was a stream to the west. It said the water was shallow at that time of year, but as we all know, water doesn't have to be that deep for someone to drown. When teachers failed to locate Manami, the police were called and hundreds of volunteers came to assist in the search efforts. They were told to look for a little girl wearing a red name tag, light pink trousers, light blue athletic shoes, and a long-sleeved t-shirt with blue sleeves and a rabbit pictured on a white background. Her hair was in pigtails and she was estimated to be about 3 foot 9. Unfortunately though, no trace of the little girl was ever found. There were no footprints and none of her belongings have ever turned up. 
The lack of blood and fur quickly ruled out any sort of animal attack, and investigators were stumped as to how a small girl could go so far in such a little amount of time. When the official search efforts were officially called off, Manami's mother continued looking for her on her own for multiple months after. It's rumored a pair of shoes similar to her daughter's were found, but police determined they were not an exact match. The most popular theory behind the young girl's disappearance is that she simply fell behind the other classmates and wandered off into the wilderness. She wouldn't have been able to fend for herself in such a harsh environment, even if she avoided contact with wild animals altogether. The likelihood of finding safe food and water were practically non-existent. What I don't really understand is that if she was as frail as described, how did she wander off in the first place? Had she tried to venture off, or if the other children had dared her to do something dangerous, wouldn't she need to stop off and to rest? Yet, somehow she eluded hundreds of searchers. Is it possible someone snuck into the campground despite being closed to the public? Everyone knew that only students and teachers were allowed. If someone else were there, they would have needed to escape detention completely. Or, well, I sure would love to know more about that principal, Hiroki Sawada. What if he did follow little Minami when he saw her trailing behind her friends? There are simply too many questions and not enough answers, much like our next case. Saya Manami The disappearance I want to discuss took place in Matsudo, a city in Chiba Prefecture. Our focus is on seven-year-old first grader named Saya Manami. So, yeah, she coincidentally shares a name with the previous victim, but don't let it confuse you too much. On September 23rd of 2022, so very recently, Saya and her mother planned to visit a park near their home. They usually walk together, but on this particular Friday afternoon, Saya left the house alone with nothing but her pink scooter at 11.30. According to Japan Times, her mother followed behind her about five minutes later, but by then it was already far too late. Saya was nowhere to be found. Her height is estimated to be just over three and a half feet tall. She has short black hair, and she was last seen wearing a pale pink t-shirt, blue shorts, and pink sneakers. Japan is known for its low crime rate, especially against children. So the case quickly received national attention as volunteers poured over the streets in search for the missing girl. Security cameras showed her within 900 meters of the park that she intended to meet her mother at before surveillance footage lost sight of her. She was riding her scooter at the time, but later that day, the scooter was discovered in a different park in the neighboring city, Nagarayama. I felt this to be a strong indication of foul play which was only fueled further the next morning when her socks and shoes were found on the banks of the Edo River over 300 yards away from that park. Crimes against children are simply that uncommon in their society. What does it say about our own that a predator is our first and only assumption? Saya's parents had previously searched the area where her socks and shoes were found and they were certain the items were not there before. They could have been mistaken, of course, Air and water searches were also conducted and teachers from Saya's school helped canvas the area, but no further signs of the missing girl were ever discovered that day. On Monday, her principal explained the tragic news in a school assembly, and a few days later, Saya's hat was found over a half a mile further downstream from where her shoes had been found. The hat had her name on it, and her parents appealed to the public for any information regarding their missing daughter. Tragically, it wasn't long after that that everyone's worst fears were confirmed. Sources are unclear on when, but sometime around September 27th, a child's body was found in the Edo River. After a typhoon passed through central Japan, a cyclist discovered a small floating body and called the authorities. The discovery was made just over nine miles away from where Saya's socks and shoes were located. Obviously, investigators' first thoughts were of the little girl. Even their clothes were similar. But they waited for DNA confirmation before making the official announcement on October 4th. An autopsy concluded that most likely the cause of death was to be that of a drowning. No major injuries were visible, and her time of death was placed between one to two weeks prior. A memorial was started near the site where mourners were able to bring flowers and small gifts. Whether Saya was suspected of running off or kidnapped, 
remains unconfirmed by authorities, but it left the community too frightened to let their children go out alone for some time. It almost makes you wonder if those low crime statistics stem from the unwillingness to admit when certain cases have nefarious elements. Aside from her scooter somehow making it to an entirely different park, and the fact that her parents didn't initially see the clothing articles by the river, her parents also insist Saya hated getting her feet wet, and that she was not a big fan of water. She wouldn't have left her socks and shoes placed off to the side so neatly. Oh, and in case if you are wondering how Saya's mother could have let her walk to the park alone in the first place, again, it's really not that uncommon in Japan. Children even go shopping alone when the stores are close enough. Which, I mean, it's Japan, the stores are usually close enough. Matsudo City even boasts itself as one of the top places nationwide to raise a child. So this tragedy was particularly shocking for the residents. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange Missing 411 horror stories. These stories are always very interesting for me to look into. It's been quite a few years and I've found so many strange ones. But if you're a fan of these types of stories, I would really appreciate you supporting by hitting that like button. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes and that helps us potentially dig up new leads for these cases to potentially help get them solved. If you're new to the channel and enjoy stories like this, be sure to subscribe as I upload them nearly every single day and all things natural and supernatural. Make sure you turn on notifications so you don't miss those uploads. You can find a playlist which will be linked in the top of the description called Swallowed by the Forest, which is the series where I cover all kinds of strange and anomalous missing 411 cases, wilderness crime, and all kinds of other things that just can't be explained out in state, national, and provincial parks across North America. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, but still enjoy listening to your Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you're listening on those platforms, please be sure to drop us a 5-star rating over there as it helps us a ton. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the Swamp the way you do. Definitely let me know what cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. I'm always looking for fresh new ones to put into these videos. Definitely let me know which one you enjoyed the most as it helps me pick better stories in the future. And if you made it all the way to the end, be sure to comment today's code word, Provincial Dinosaur. I'd love to see your comments that you come up with. The funniest one will get pinned at the top. See you all soon with another creepy episode. <laughs>